welcome back. This is a very exciting episode. Um, I'm having a conversation with Guy Pierce, and Guy and I have known each other for, I think, about six months now. We have been texting back and forth, we've actually met, and at our last meeting, I said to him, hey, Guy, I'd love to get you on my podcast. There's a lot of stuff I'd love to talk about, because he's a really deep guy. Guy is a deep guy. Um, And he said, yeah, that sounds great, but I also have questions for you. So I said, well, why don't we have this backwards and forwards? Um, you ask me questions, I ask you questions. So this is not so much of an interview of me interviewing Guy. It's sort of a backwards and you know forwards conversation, incredible conversation. For those of you who don't know who Guy Pierce is, he is an actor and a musician. Uh, let me read you his bio. Guy Pierce was born October fifth, nineteen sixty-seven, in the UK to Margaret Anne and Stuart Graham Pierce. His father was born in Auckland, New Zealand, to English and Scottish parents, while Guy's mother is English. Pierce and his family initially traveled to Australia for two years after his father was offered the position of chief test pilot for the Australian government. Guy was just three years old. After deciding to stay in Australia and settling in the Victorian city of Geelong, Guy's father was killed five years later in an aircraft test flight, leaving Guy's mother, a school teacher, to care for him and his older sister, Tracy. Having little interest in subjects at school like math or science, Guy favored art, drama, and music. He joined local theater groups at a young age and appeared in such productions as The King and I, Fiddler on the Roof, and The Wizard of Oz. In 1985, just two days after his final high school exam, Guy started a four-year stint as Mike Young on the popular Aussie soap Neighbors. At age 20, Guy appeared in his first film, Heaven Tonight. Then, after a string of appearances in film, television, and on the stage, he won the role of an outrageous drag queen in The Adventures of Priscilla, Queen of the Desert. He has amazed film critics and audiences alike with his magnificent performances in L.A. Confidential, Memento, The Proposition, Factory Girl, The Hurt Locker, The King's Speech, and the HBO miniseries Mildred Pierce. Next to acting, Guy has had a lifelong passion for music and songwriting. So in the conversation, I mentioned an actor um, who I couldn't remember his name. It was, it's Jason Begay. So when you hear me talk about an actor, Jason Begay. One final thing before we start. I do now have a Patreon account. It's patreon.com forward slash Mark Vicente. If you like what I'm doing, if you'd like to support all the stuff I want to do, please go there and sign up. Also, wherever you listen to this podcast, please subscribe. Whether it's YouTube, Apple, Spotify, wherever it is, subscribe. Also, give me a good rating. I would really appreciate that. So here it is, my conversation with Guy Pierce. So I'm really thrilled that you joined me on the podcast today. Thank you for making the time. I know you're running all over the world at, at all times. And I kind of, I want the, to tell the audience, because they don't know this, that you actually reached out to me originally. Of course. Yeah, absolutely. And it was, I think it was February of this year, 2023. Yeah, I think it was January that I that we were watching The Vow, maybe late January. It was, in fact, because I, I was in Ireland watching it, and we can talk about all this, obviously. But, yeah, so I was in yeah. Ireland filming in January, so it was then that I first saw uh, the show. And so, yeah. yeah and first of all, I was very surprised. And then secondly, you were so uh, obviously enthused about chatting and so... I think you're just blown away by by watching the vow, yeah, and totally. I, I suppose enthralled and disturbed. But I wonder, I, I wonder if you wouldn't mind just talking a bit about what that experience was like, like what what the vow brought up for you, and then I do want to talk about the clearing as well. Yeah, well, it it, it was amazing, really. I mean, I've always been fascinated in, I've always been fascinated in organized groups, um, and I and I think. I'm someone who tends to be a bit of a lone wolf. You know, I tend to sort of function out there in the world on my own a lot. I I don't like to ask for help. Uh, my mother was a bit the same, um, and 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 so I've 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 always shied away from uh, kind of organised groups, even if they're social groups or sporting groups. But at the same time, I'm really drawn to them, and I'm fascinated by the psychology, and I'm envious. I'm really envious of how easy it is i think for people to join groups and to socialize and i mean you know a lot of this comes back to my mother and her attitude to the world and one of my mother's classic sayings was 
Ugh, the world would be so much of a better place if there weren't any bloody people in it. <laughs> so so she, she, in some way, and it's maybe it's hereditary, but in some way uh, she instilled this idea of being independent, relying on only yourself and, and, and you know, I, I think that has caused a lot of social anxiety for me, uh, a lot of difficulty, as I say, in asking for help. Um, and it's just... It's just not natural for me to um, involve myself in any kind of group. Having said that, whenever I do, I get so much out of it. I really, I come away feeling really fulfilled. I come away feeling like I've just woken up to something. I come away feeling like, why don't I do this all the time? And that fascination is always in the back of my mind. Uh, and, and one of those threads of fascination is religion. And one of those threads of fascination is, of course, the extreme uh, events that occur that we see that, that happen in cults and that, that, that there's a need, there's some kind of need within people to rely on others to, to find fulfilment in themselves. So, so all of that as a sort of a backstory to me means that whenever I come across any story and over the years I've, you know, I've been fairly fixated or fascinated on on David Koresh, for example, in Waco or Jim Jones or various, you know, um, various groups, cults that have existed before. I, uh, and in fact, I was asked once to play Charles Manson. And of course, I was really drawn to the idea, but I just thought I was such wrong casting that I'd never did it. Um, Interesting. But this idea of, and, and, and obviously, and, and, and you, you know, I can't, speak for you and your experience but the impression that i get is that the what draws somebody into a group in the first place that then becomes twisted and there's 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 power um manip there's manipulation and then there's there's a loss of power loss of one's own identity it's and, and independence and and then it becomes something else and that sort of that that idea and that um uh, recognition of how malleable and how vulnerable we are is something I'm very fascinated in. And it's something I think I'm really, uh, I have my sort of hooks in when I'm playing any role, when I'm, when I'm acting, when I'm finding a character and I, and, and I realize how, and, and even in just in real life, how, how easy it is for us to be swayed one way or, or the other. So, I was in Ireland in the beginning of the year filming. I was doing a film called Sunrise and I was in contact with Carice, who was back here in Holland. And she said to me, she'd started watching The Vow and mm -hmm. said, oh my, you, you, you know, and we've watched a few shows together. You know, we don't watch a lot of television, but we can go down the crime road uh, pretty easily, um, even to the point where we'll watch air crash disasters and, you know, <laughs> We, and we joke and we say to each other, hey, shall we watch a bit of death? You know, oh it's just a silly sort of <laughs> joke that was a bit of death tonight. Yeah, great. Uh, so, of course, she put me onto the vow and just she was fixated and, and I knew I, it was something I had to see. Even though she's for years been saying to me, I've got to see Breaking Bad and I just refuse to do it. So, so she can't always convince me to watch everything that she wants me to see. Breaking Bad, I'm sure I'll get to it one day, but maybe two years. But past. why not Breaking Why Why no one Breaking Bad? Really weird. Uh, I can't stand the name of it. Really? I just find it. I just find it. Uh, there's something about that title that I just go, ugh. And, and wow. it's a terrible thing. To, and I apologize profusely to any Breaking Bad fans <laughs> out there who will, who will never watch another one of my films again because I've just dissed <laughs> their show. And I know deep down that it is amazing. I, 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 yeah. Everyone has told me the writing's great, acting. I'm yeah. absolutely sure. Performances are amazing, yeah. And, absolutely. And I, and, yeah. and I just don't watch a lot of television. I, I don't watch a lot of series television. Um, I never watched Game of Thrones. I never watched The Sopranos. I, you know, wow. So I really... I, I just wa would rather be in here in the music studio creating music instead of sitting in front of the television. Yeah. Um, I can do it for a while and, and, and you know, if it's a short sort of, uh, you know, whatever, I, I, yeah. I, can, I can do it. Yeah. But, of course, The Vow was right up my alley. And, and so I started to watch it when I was in Ireland. Uh, so I was sort of rushing home. I was only there for a week. <laughs> I was filming for a week. And I'm on set... 
And I'd sort of started watching The Vow the evening before and the evening before that. And, of course, I'm on set going, so what, what time are we wrapping today? What time are we – We're done, am I done at – so we're done at 5, but am I in the last shot? Because I could probably go at 4.30, right? If I, you know, so there I am just sort of <laughs> wanting to get back to the hotel room so I can watch the next episode of your, of your mm-hmm. turmoil. Um, and – so the experience, so sorry, this is a long-winded answer. Oh, no, 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 this is fantastic. I didn't hear any of this before. Uh, so the the thing I think that really, I mean, and I got to this point, but the thing I think that really uh, struck me, aside from, and we'll talk about my feelings about you and my impression of you, uh, but the fact that I came away from it going, I, I even though I'm not someone who wants to join groups, I can I can understand what, joining that group. I can absolutely understand it. And I think we probably, as outsiders, we hear about cults, and I know you've said this before, you know, nobody joins a cult. Nobody sets out to join a cult. Somebody joins something good and it turns. And for somebody like me who doesn't really like to join groups, I looked at that and I went, yeah, I, I could see myself doing that. I could absolutely see myself had you or or, or any of the other sort of lovely, well-spoken, articulate, um, considerate, um, non-weird people <laughs> had have said to me, hey, you know, come along to this thing because it's really cool. I could mm. see myself going, oh, well, if you're doing it, then I'll come along. Mm. So that was something that really got under my skin and really affected me. And so, of course, my fascination with Keith and what then Keith was able to, shall we say, achieve, um, really resonated. And and I just, yeah. I, I, and so, of course, seeing you as much as we do through that show and Bonnie, of course, but seeing you and, and the way in which you were able to dissect what was happening for you and the way in which you were able to understand and articulate, and I'm sure, and I'll, I'll ask you this, but I'm, I assume your ability to analyse and to understand what has happened has helped you through it. Because I guess one of my questions for you is, I... Are you traumatized by that experience? Mm. I, I would have to assume, on some level, some people are terribly traumatized by it. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. So, uh, yeah. So, sorry, I'll get back to that question in a sec. So, I, yeah. but I come away going, how would I, how would I have felt at the end of all of this? And mm. so, my reaching out to you, I just was so drawn to reaching out to you because I feel like you and I. I, I, I get you immediately. You, you're so articulate. You're so considerate. You, you've got such a big heart. You're, you've, you're so non-judgmental, but you're very discerning. I love how you speak. I love how you sort of break the world down. I mean, obviously through your filmmaking as well. Mm-hmm. Um, but I just find you're a kindred spirit. And I, and I went, I have to talk to this guy. I have to yeah. talk to Mark. And so Carissa, and, I, and so then when I told Carissa, I said, I've, I've reached out to Mark. And she's like, yeah, t- of course, of course you have. <laughs> so, so it was wonderful to, to reach out to you and, and to yeah. go, oh my gosh, I, I cannot believe. It's like meeting a famous person. You go, I cannot believe I'm actually, you know, this thing that has affected me so much. I'm now. So funny. I'm sort I of mean, on, not on the given- inside, but you know. Given your level of fame, that's a funny thing to say. It's like meeting a famous person. Um, I want to a famous person, though. I, honestly, I really do. That's the, there's something I wanted to say to you that that because my audience, by the way, will hate if I don't talk about some of your stuff, your work. But I start. I th- I think I told you I started watching a Spy Amongst Friends, mm-hmm. the uh, the piece that you did, the series you did with with Damien. Yes, uh, Damien Lewis. And yeah, yeah. I have not gotten past the first episode. I just finished the first episode yesterday, and I was so I was so pained and distraught uh, because of the relationship of the the two of you as as best friends for so long and and spies, and then what seemed like his feeling that you, that your character had betrayed him. And I sat there and thought, Oh Jesus, I know what this feels like. Wow. I was so moved watching watching the first episode because I was like, I know what that feels like. Yeah. You know, I know what it feels like to have what you think is a certain kind of friendship. Now, the friendship that portrayed in in your series is much deeper and more profound than than the friendship that I thought I had with Ranieri because I was terrified of Ranieri as well. Sure. But the feeling of like, so I've lived a lie like all this time, 
so I just think that particular show of yours is is fascinating. And by the way, your wow. your your performances, both you and Damien, just I mean everybody in that show, incredible. Uh, well, thank you. I mean, it's I've worked with that director before, with Nick Murphy, and he pulls performances out of you that you don't even know you have, for a start. Um, and the writing was so great. I'm really happy with what I got to do in the show. It's it's it really feels great, and the 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 subtlety and nuance, and 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 as you point out, the the betrayal. You know that feeling that 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 you think you know something about somebody. You think you're perception of this relationship is is what it is when in actual fact it's something else and of course we all have experiences where friends let us down friends lie to us friends tell us little white lies or friends kind of hide things so we're all as life goes on we we bump up against these um experiences that i guess toughen us up or or you know, send us down a black hole because it's too devastating. Um, and, and that, again, that brings me back to the thing about how malleable, malleable we are. And, and I can see why you and the experience that you had can relate to, you know, this, at least in this first episode, what, what's happened between um, Kim Philby and, and Nicholas Elliott. Mm -hmm. But of course, you know, it's, it's, well, I guess that, I guess the, I guess the outcome is the same, isn't it? That, you, that you, it's it's like magic, where something was there and then it's not there, and you go, "Yeah, what happened? Where did that yeah. go? What was that? What you know?" And yeah. I suppose this is why I ask you whether whether that was a trauma for you, or whether, yeah. you, or, or, or what it was, what it is. So, as you say it, I'm thinking about. So I think the the, the problem is that you hang your best virtues on this relationship with other people, a leader and organization. Like you bring the very best of yourself forward and you sort of dress this thing with all your best virtues. And then to discover that it's all pointless and all a lie. It, it not only is a feeling of betrayal, it affects those deep virtues of, uh, 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 that you have. Yes, it it poisons them and it, it makes them it feels counterfeit. And like, so that that's a lie too. all these things that I feel, all these things that I believe, who I believe I am. It's and all I guess, bullshit. Because, I guess because through that process and how long were you there for? How long was your 12 years total? I mean, yeah, that's, exactly. That's amazing as well, isn't it? And, and, and I've heard you speak uh, where you've talked about if you ever had any doubts, if you ever, like when, if you, when you went to Nancy and you said, I feel like this is perhaps questionable, that their ability to immediately throw that back on you and go, oh, well, we need to address this, this weakness in you. Yeah. This, that as a device yeah. is so toxic, isn't it? And, yeah. and you see it happen, you know, in various ways in life where people aren't honest enough to go, oh my gosh, of course, yes, I'm so sorry, you've pointed something out and I'll let me address yeah. that. They turn yeah. that back on you. That, that really, because that then takes advantage of that, of how malleable we are, how vulnerable yes. we are. Yes. And, and to do that in such a, oh, I mean, I, yeah, I, I still can't get my head around it and I suppose I can't get my head around it because I haven't experienced it. I'm, I'm trying to analyze it from an intellectual point of view. I feel to some degree the emotion of it. Yeah. But, and I'm so amazed at, at, at who you are now having gone through what you've gone. And I assume you and Bonnie have been incredible supports for each other. Oh, amazing. I mean, yeah, beyond. we are each other's rock. And also because, you know, when you come out of something like that, you have no clear bearing on reality. You have no idea what reality is because it's sort of it, it. You thought you had an anchor, you know, you thought you were anchored inside yourself and, 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 and this this ideology, which you believe is the externalization of your best values. And then suddenly the anchor snaps and then you don't you're like underwater. You don't know what's up, what's down. Yeah. You have no idea who you are. That that in itself is a trauma. So there's, tra there's betrayal traumas. Um, there's also just shock, you know, you yes. kind of go into shock. Yes. And in a very sort of military metaphor, the, what, what helped me in some ways, but delayed my healing was just going to war. Well, now I have a purpose. 
My purpose is I must destroy this thing so that this thing can never hurt anybody else. That is my mission. Yes. But that only lasts so long because then once your mission's over, you're like a soldier who's like, well, now what? Because now I'm used to fighting, you know? Yeah, how do I deal with being in the supermarket, pushing a trolley around? Exactly right. <laughs> wow. Exactly and right. I have to ask you, the period between Bonnie um, waking up, mm -hmm. and, and if, if this is the, and correct me if this term isn't appropriate, and, and then you waking up or you really going, aha, that mm -hmm. period in there, was that troubling? Was that, was that difficult? Very. I'm sure. Yeah. Very, very. Was there a um, point in there? Was there a point in there where you went, where it, it made you question seriously your relationship with Bonnie? Then did you, did, did, or were you hanging? Were you sort of foot in both camps and going, I, I, was, I, I've got to find where my loyalty is here. Yeah, it was foot in both camps. The one thing though, and the great question she asked me is, you know. Where, where is your loyalty kind of thing? I don't remember the exact question she asked me. And it, I had to check in with myself and, and I realized my loyalty is always to you. Yeah. That, that will trump everything else. But see, what happened is Ranieri and the other people in the cult were just bad-mouthing her all the time, trying to get me to, to believe that she was the problem. You know, they would talk about her as a squeaky wheel and a whole bunch of things. Um, but I had to check in really deeply with myself and underneath all the programming down deep, deep in my heart and my soul. Like I knew this was, this was, this was my wife. This was the person, you know, I love more than anything. So that actually is what, that's what got me out. Yeah. Is How that long was anchor. That period? How long was that period? It was about three months because so June, sorry, January, 2017 is when she officially resigns. The end of March is when I'm like, holy shit. It's not this, none of this is what I thought. She'd already, at the end of the year before, had been talking about these things. But the, the, the smart thing is she'd been um, talking to a, a cult exit counselor who was right. talking to her about how to deal with me. Yeah, okay. And she was saying things like, do not attack the leader. Do not attack this. Do not attack that. Try and show him stuff. You know, so she was very smart in what she did. And she showed me certain, you know, TV shows and and. You know, there was you know, a certain actor that I liked very much who had left Scientology. And she said, well, watch this guy because you like him and you want to work with him. So I watched that guy. And she was trying to deprogram me very, very gently. But, but you uh, knew why she was showing you these things? And, and no. Or, or that, was she, no. Okay, she was, yeah, she was having no, to be she, There was an actor whose name I forget now. He was on, the, he's on Chicago PD, um, whose name I've completely forgotten, but I can flash on the screen later. But I really liked him. And he was in Californication as well. And, and then she said, well, watch this. He talks about leaving Scientology. It's really interesting. And so I, I didn't relate it at all, but I really liked him. And I liked seeing him not as a character, just being himself, talking about unraveling from some, some bad organization. Because every other organization was bad. Ours was not. Yeah. And these were the kinds of things that she was doing to help me, to help create cracks. Because what you need to do is you need to create cra enough of a crack. Yeah that hopefully it can, it can widen. You know? And I guess the thing is, I mean, it isn't just that this is an outside person who's trying to get you out. This is somebody who was in there with you, who is now yeah. out. So yeah. just that in itself, even if she didn't try to get you out, you're there going, I know she got out because she has her reasons. Yeah. So there's immediately some, I suppose, some kind of... Not and there's also, there's also respect because I had tremendous respect for her decision. Nobody else had respect for a decision. I had yeah. tremendous respect for a decision. I was worried about, look, how does this work now? You know, because yeah. there's a series of things. And look, just so you know, like a lot of us, you know, myself, Bonnie, Sarah, Nippy, we, we knew the organization was just a, a shambles. We didn't understand it was evil at first, but right. we knew the thing was a shambles. It wasn't working well. And we were starting to come to the conclusion that this thing was not designed to, to, to create success at all. In fact, the, 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 in 2000, actually, in between my full wake up, I was having meetings with the executive board and the higher ranks saying, guys, I don't know if you know this, but this organization of ours is not designed to, to have people succeed. It's designed to actually have people um, stay cloistered and afraid of everything. And they were like, what? And I, so I was very strong about this. And Ranieri you, was trying to. And were you saying that because there were examples of people who just weren't, there were just no examples of people succeeding? Yeah. 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 But also what happened is every time you came up with some idea, you wanted to do 
it was it was poo pooed or you were told the reason it was a bad idea. And I was thinking right. to myself, how come all these people who are already successful entrepreneurs are being told that's a shit idea? Because I'm like, they've made a lot of money and they've done very well their way. So I'm, like, I'm so fascinated. I'm so fascinated in the progression of Ranieri. The the what the psychology of him at certain points and and at what point and i get you know and i've heard you speak about the fact that he wasn't grandiose he in fact sort of played the humble the humble servant and you know that he wasn't bragging about his achievements other people would do that for him etc and i get and i had a very manipulative friend and i and i i kept relating everything to this old friend of mine rob who i have nothing to do with anymore and mm-hmm. and he just couldn't help himself, but because I guess he felt powerless and he felt he was drowning in the world somehow. So his his objective constantly was to play games and toy with people, and he was very good at it, really good at it, and really sort of charming and charismatic, and the number of people who would come to me, and he ended up getting into the film industry through me, and so, of course, I would meet people in the film industry and go, oh, my gosh, I've met your friend Rob. He's amazing. He's incredible. Wow, I love him. And then a year later, I'd see that same person and they go, if I ever see him again, I'm going to fucking break his neck. He stole this and he did this. And I'm like, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. And and the drive of him, and I, I, I looked at Keith in the same way, I suppose, that there's this there's this impulse within someone like him. And I can't, I can't uh, sort of say that I know the extent of this or truly understand the psychology of it, but it feels that there's this impulse to just be trying to find his own power because he feels powerless in a way. And at whatever form that comes in, whether it's just one person in a relationship that he's got power over, and then he can juggle a second person. And before he knows it, he's got 80,000 people signed up and 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 he's still managing it. And you know what it's like. You eat three chocolate biscuits and then you go, well, I've eaten all three now. I might as well eat the whole pack. <laughs> so so I'm sure for him, he goes, well, I can juggle this person and that person and another and another. This is just sort of endless. And I, I guess there's an insatiability or an insatiableness. What's the word? I guess, I guess it's... Ins- uh, uh, one of those words. It works for me. <laughs> I get it. That's where, interesting. That's interesting. Well, yeah, yeah. we're... Because because I'm sure in the beginning he didn't set out to go, I want to have the biggest organization where I tell people they're full of power, that, that, that they're going to be successful, but I'm actually mm-hmm. not going to let any of them be successful. I'm, mm-hmm. I'm sure he didn't think that far ahead. I'm sure yeah. he thought that far ahead in a way, but mm-hmm. it must have just developed and developed and developed and developed, right? See. There are some people that say, you know, Keith started good and he turned bad. And that's, that's not my opinion. My opinion is there was always a pathology there. Yes, what no, I, I, think, I think that. I definitely yeah. think that. Yeah. What I, I think, think the scale of it. Yes. What I think goes on with someone like that is there's a, a, there's a, a child stuck in, a, in an adult body who has childish impulses for a neediness, basically. Yeah. I think that I discovered in the end that he's incredibly needy. Yeah. The reason he needed all this around him was to try to fill that black hole, which is endless. And the problem, as you know, is once you get a hit of something, you need more and more and more. So more and more power to try to irrationally eradicate the, the emptiness and the insecurity. And it's, and it's never enough. I yeah. think that's, that's my version of what I think was going well, on. I th- that makes absolute sense. And the simplicity of that, as you say, a child in an adult's body, you know, and having my own child now and watching him sort of do in his childish view of the world, watch him do his childlike kind of, even though he's trying to be a grown up. Yeah. So I sort of admire him for it in a way, cause he's only six. Yeah. But I, but I, I, I would fucking hate an adult trying to do the same thing. So, yeah. you know. Yeah. And also, you know, I was thinking about like Ranieri was big on, <clears throat> you know, having character and principle and everything. And I think what motivated it was cause a person that is needy like that, can never admit I'm needy. No. So they have to make a story about a feeling they're having. So they have a feeling, but they have to make a story. And then along the way, they, they think to themselves, you know, I need to help people build character. And so for character, they need commitment. So I need them to commit to something. And I think they lose track of the, the, the realization that, the, that their neediness is causing them to create this fantasy of control and power. Mm-hmm. I don't think they're, they're aware of it. I think there are some people... 
you know, some narcissistic sociopaths and psychopaths that are aware of this. But I believe that in Ranieri's case, he was not aware. He's, I, think you, I think these kinds of people, they're covering everything. They have to have a story for why I feel this feeling, why I feel upset when somebody doesn't pay attention to me and give me what I need. But I can't admit it's that. I can't admit I'm having a tantrum. So I have yeah. to make up a story, I yeah. think. I remember you telling, uh, I heard an interview of yours and you said that there was a moment where Keith, um, I think it was when you were playing basketball or volleyball together or something, he got really angry at somebody. And you mm. said to him, I've never seen you angry. And mm. he said, I wasn't. I just, yeah. I just, um, I just raised my, my, my mood or something to match that other person's order. And you yeah. were like, mm. yeah. <laughs> well, in the end, in the end, I bought it, but it bothered me, you know, the, the entire time. I mean, I, I think, it, I think to myself, and I think this is something that's obviously, you know, useful for actors as well. Is like, I always try to figure out like what it feels like. You know, is there ever a time in my life when I wanted to feel bolder or look bolder than I actually was, mm -hmm. and so I couldn't admit something, and I just went straight to the story. Because that's the only thing that could keep my worldview intact, my emotional little bubble that's so fragile intact. And I think to myself, yeah, I did that shit. I did that shit when I was a teenager. I did that shit in my 20s. You know, hopefully you grow out of it to yeah. be an authentic human being, you know? Yeah, I, I completely agree. And I, and I, and I related. I mean, I, you know, I ask myself the question <clears throat> quite often. I mean, I, I don't so much anymore, I guess, but, but it still comes up, which is why do I act? What is it about? What's the validity there? I wanted to ask you that. Yeah. Well, and I, and you know, and I understand I was doing a series of interviews for LA Confidential back in 1997 when the film came out. <clears throat> and it was those ones where you sit in a room and there's a camera pointed at you and you every yeah. five minutes you are sent to a different TV network around America and there was about a hundred of them in a row. So I sat there for like Jeez. three hours and, you know, and everyone was very, was very complimentary and people loved the film and it was all very positive, positive, positive. And all of a sudden out of the blue somewhere, I can't remember where it was, some journalist said to me, so you're an actor. And I went, yeah. And he said, so basically you're just a liar, right? And it mm. really struck me. Like it really, mm. I just couldn't stop thinking about it. It really... It was quite an eye-opening experience. It was quite a turning point. And because I knew that I'd been a liar in my life a lot, mm. and I knew deep down that I, I lied to cover, you know, I cover, mm. I pretend I'm more intelligent than I am, I pretend I'm more funny than I am, I pretend all sorts of stuff, and I, that's where mm. my acting skill comes from. Mm. And this guy pointed it out mm. and, and, and on live national television or whatever state television I was mm. on, you know, and mm. I went, Oh no, I mean, come on, <laughs> you know, and I sort of floundered my way through some bullshit answer. And, but it really struck me. And then, and then by about 1999, I was, ha cause I was working in the States a lot then. And it was, it was, it was too much work and it was one job to the next. And, it, and really uh, one of the things that you don't learn as an actor is that, when you have time in between jobs, that's actually valuable because yeah. you're recharging and you are, you know, finding yourself again in order to be able to go out into the world and be another right. character. Right. But of course, no one teaches you that. You just think, make hay while the sun shines. <laughs> so when you get the chance to work back to back to back, you do it. And then you realize you've emptied out, you're, you know. So yeah. by the end of 99 or 2000, 2001, uh, I really, I mean, through 99, 2000, 2001, I really started to kind of have a bit of a breakdown. I was horrible to people. I was so intolerant. I really just couldn't bear the, you know, anything that felt, you know, fake or conversations that people would have that was small. To I just was had no tolerance for anything. And I, and I thought, I've got to sort myself out here. I've got to take myself away. And, and in the back of my mind constantly was this thing that this guy had said, which is, you're just a liar then, aren't you? You know, and I had mm. to, and I took a year off from acting, sort of mm. 2000 to, uh, 2001 into 2002. And I thought, I've got to answer this question for myself. I've got to find what that means. I've got to understand that. And, you know, the thing you have to realize is I'd been acting, I'd been doing theater since I was eight years old. Oh, yeah, right. Since I was a kid. <clears throat> and there I was as a 30 year old having a career and a life based on the decision of an eight-year-old. Yeah. 
And I needed to step away from that and come back to it and make that decision as an adult to find the validity in it, to find whether I was just a liar and that's all acting was, it was just lying, or actually whether I could, as I say, find validity and see the value and, and, and try and understand it. It just took me a long time to get my head around it. And I suppose my my uh, sort of resulting um, feeling and and uh, idea of it all is we're all born with this ability to act. We're all born with this ability to mean say one thing and mean something else. Even the Dalai Lama uh, says you've got to fake it till you make it. <laughs> and uh, that's a that's a tool that we have all of us ingrained to survive. And of course, we can either choose to use that for good or we can either choose to use that for evil. And mm -hmm. the thing that I came to terms with was I've got to stop telling any lies to anybody. I need to just be really honest about everything. I want to be really honest. And the thing that I realized about acting, I suppose, was that if I'm not... if it's not that I'm lying. I'm trying to find the truth in a character that I'm playing. So if I'm Guy pretending to be someone else and it's and, and Guy is the driving force, then Guy is just lying, I guess, to some degree. But we're not lying because we know the cinema goer has paid money to go to the cinema and he's watching a movie. So he's not being lied to. So I got my head around a whole lot of that stuff. And I found I was able to find validity in what it is I did and you know, and a, and a whole lot of um, more positive, um, uh, yeah, more po positive elements to, to this job that I had. And I was able to sort of come back to it. But, and I'm sorry to go on, but I, but I guess when you look at Ranieri, when you look at children, when you look at this ability that we have just to go, no, 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 I saw a pink elephant flying over the bridge and it was really amazing, you know, that just to yeah. tell a story that isn't actually yeah. true. What do we then do with that ability when we grow up? What do we yeah. do with it? And some people, yeah. some people, yeah, might keep on doing it. But this is the thing that I wanted to to ask you about, or or well, first to tell you is that, <clears throat> and I'm I'm sure you've heard this before, but like, you are a phenomenal actor, and the reason Thank for you. me that you are is because, like, I can feel the the emotional wheels turning in your face when mm -hmm. I watch you, like reaction shots, you know, watching a reaction shot. I was the spy amongst friends the other day. I was watching you react to something. And I'm thinking, geez, there's so much going on in there. Right. And it feels authentic to me. And then, you know, having now spent time with you, you know, we've been, you know how they used to have pen pals. We've become like uh, text pals. Yeah. yeah. Um, and then spending some time with you in person, you're so fucking genuine. You know, there's, there's like, there's very little artifice that I can see. There's just like, well, what you see is what you get, which I, I assume is is better for your performance because you, there's something very raw about your performances, and there's also honestly something very raw about you as a as a human being. You know? Well, thank you, thank you, and uh, and I, it's funny because so much of it to me is about energy, and I realize that lying takes a lot of energy, and you've got to have a really good memory as well. And <laughs> and it's it's just exhausting. And so there's this. I think there's this natural impulse for us to connect with each other, for human mm. beings to connect with each other. And but there's also a natural fear of our vulnerability, mm. and, and that it being that being taken advantage of. And so we put up walls and we put up barriers and we sort of we 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 you know we you know we we act bigger and better than we are and we mm -hmm. you know. And then we've got to sort of keep those balls in the air. Mm -hmm. I, I feel that as the last 20 years have gone on, I've gotten so much better at going. And, and look, it's on many levels, it's been easier because I can look back at this body of work and go, no, I'm all right at what I do. <laughs> I got that, you know. So, mm -hmm. so that's a sort of a, a helpful tool. But at the same time, I think, you know, 25 years of therapy has helped as well where, mm. where I've, where I've been able to at least look at myself and go, when am I not being honest? When was, when, when did I make a decision or when did I, you know, what, what drives my decisions and my, the things that I say. And, and I find generally that the connections that I make with people like with your good self, 
uh, where it's just based on sort of no energy wasted, you know, no energy wasted honesty. It's just, it's such a relief and it's so, and then you're just open. You're just open to what the world brings you. And I find absolutely that I can do that with a character now. Not all characters, you know, some characters I have to sort of construct something because I can't quite get in. Mm. But if I can just get in and feel that character, then I go, oh, great, I'm just surfing in this sea. I'm just Mm. swimming in this water now. Yeah, let's do that. Mm -hmm. And I can start tomorrow. I don't have to spend three months preparing, you know. Mm -hmm. So when it's funny when you do interviews and they say, what did you do to prepare for this? I'm like, well, I read Mm -hmm. the script and I got inspired. (laughs) (laughs) That's what I did, you know. But but that's interesting because I wanted to ask you, because you have so much fluidity, you know, as, as, as an actor. Like you've done the most extraordinarily different things if you look at your body of work. And I keep wondering, it seems, you seem to have found a very healthy way that there's the true guy in there and then there's who you become, mm-hmm. but then you come back to guy. So the, the question I have is, did you ever get lost and if you did, like, how did you eventually find your true self in, in that process of acting? Um, it's a good question. One of the things that used to happen a lot, and this is what I'm a lot better at these days, is <clears throat> I got really panicked and really worried that I was... If, once I could see that character in my head, I kind of imagine, like when you read a book and you kind of imagine that world and you go, oh, I can fully see it and I can, I'm in there. It's the same thing. I was always panicked and worried that I was going to lose it and panicked, funnily enough, I guess that the true guy would come back and I'd go, oh, no, I'm just guy again. I don't know where that guy, Mm. I don't know where that other person went, but shit, I've lost Mm. him and I've got cameras rolling. You know, this Mm. is a problem. So Mm. I would be on set, you know, I'd film something and I'd go back to my chair and no one could talk to me. I had to, I had to sort of really like, you know, and it wasn't because I was method. I don't, I don't. Well, I'm, I wasn't. Mm-hmm. It was just about hanging on to, <laughs> hanging on mm-hmm. to this thing, and that was really exhausting. I learnt that that was particularly through that period, that late nineties period, mm-hmm. you know, where I did Memento and I'd, I'd done LA Confidential, and then I went into, you know, Count of Monte Cristo and Time mm-hmm. Machine and big, big jobs and and a lot of work and trying to hang on was so exhausting. And once I, I think it, through that process of taking a year off and looking at it and having a better perspective of it all, I started to trust myself more that I had this tool and this skill that I could reach out and just pick up and use when I needed to. And then I could put it down when I didn't need to. And Mm. I, and I sort of, I literally was sort of practicing that on set where I would film a scene and go, okay, now go back to your chair Go back to your chair and and have that chat with the grips, the grip or the props guy who wants to have a chat. Just have a chat with him about whatever else, and mm. then and then then for the next scene, go go back. So I was sort of practicing going back and forth, mm. and I and I I developed that. And there are definitely times though now, um, and it might be to do with accent where I'm on set and I've got a really full on accent and there's some Aussie crew member who comes up to me just before a take and mate, so, uh, you know, what are right there? Right? And I'm like, I can't talk to you right now. Yeah. <laughs> Stop it. Yeah. Like, like if you're trying to sing a song and you hear another song on the radio and you, you can't do both, you know? So yeah. I still have moments, but I can laugh about it now. I have, I have had moments where I've got lost in a char- in a character and I've got, but that's usually just within a scene uh, and that's really exciting. That's mm-hmm. that's sort of amazing because you take yourself away and then you kind of come back again. It's like you it's like you had a dream moment and then you've woken up going, "Whoa, that really happened," you know. Yeah. Uh, and that's the funny thing is having those moments, finding the truth in a character help helps me find the truth in myself. Yes. Because I get to experience what truth is. I get yes. the feeling of truth. That makes perfect sense. Because yeah. I was going to ask you at one point, you know, you know, what is your philosophy of acting, which is such a very common, a common question. But because I, I feel like for you, it has something to do with truth and authenticity. Yeah, very much so. And, 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 you know, I had some trauma when I was younger. My dad died when I was really young. And <clears throat> I have a sister with an intellectual disability and, and I helped 
my mother raise her and that was quite, you know, demanding and beautiful, but demanding. Um, and I think there was a lot of, my mother uh, was, in, you know, still, still would be if she could be, uh, a great kind of performer herself and, and um, not an actual actor, but, but um, you know, she was very much in control of things and, and really uh, another quote of hers was after my father died, uh, someone tried to offer her some sympathy and say, oh, I'm so sorry about, about what happened. And she said, it's not like he left me. Mm. You know, don't give mm. me your sympathy. Uh, and I mean, she got to, she always got to stay in control and she got to stay in control by sort of fending off people and by constructing. And so there's a lot of acting going on with my mother. And I think I've sort of, in a panicked way, function in the same way. And so I've, I've spent my life desperately going, no, I just want to be, I just want to be true. <laughs> if yeah. someone kind of abuses me for something, I just want to take it on the chin and go, okay, great, thanks for yeah. telling me that, you know, instead yeah. of getting defensive back. I, I don't, it's exhausting. It's just too exhausting. It is. And I think that's honestly one of the reasons I've enjoyed chatting with you so much is because, you know, when you're in this kind of cult high control group thing, everything's about artifice. You're constantly having to pretend you're not feeling the thing you're feeling because if, <laughs> Because if you if you admit it, you're you're failing. So there's an enormous amount of stress in your body. Yes. Because you have to behave a certain way, and so a lot of us who have left these kinds of things are are, are allergic to bullshit. Allergic. Yeah. And yeah, yeah. all we want is to have a real conversation with somebody, and not have to pretend. Yeah. You know, yeah, let it you all know that you've been pretending. Even though I'm sure. Yeah. And and I'm I assume through a lot of the time, you, 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 well I guess there's levels of under, of understanding. But I was going to say that I assume you don't know you're pretending. But I guess to some degree you know. But to but some degree, I think you do to some degree because you feel. The problem is you can't spend too much time on that question because if you spend too much time on the question, the game's up. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. You know, so you have to kind of keep those kinds of things at bay. Like they would come into my awareness and say, like this is, doesn't feel right. And then I would be like, well, that's just a feeling I'm having. And that's not rational. But really, what is going on, the sort of the, the subconscious subtext is I'm fucking terrified to have that thought and go down the pathway yeah. of where that thought takes me, which is the shit's unhealthy. Yeah. And I guess for you, and I, I guess for you, and I, I suppose for a lot of other people, you join something because you you think it's about good. You, I know you wanted to make good in the world. You, you know, and I know some of your history uh, growing up in South Africa, uh, and and trying to find good and make good in the world. And and if you if you start to rely on something or somebody, then the last thing you want to do is get down the road and go. I oh, actually, no, no, this is. I'm going to go somewhere else. This is. Yeah. I'm sure that dilemma is is a tricky one. Very. And also just admitting you fucked up, admitting you made a mistake, which I yeah. think is very healthy. You know, but until you've until you've admitted failure, like it's terrifying. And yes. until you've said like I you know what I I screwed up. Yeah. I made a mistake. I misjudged this thing. Um I th which I think is very freeing because because the minute you can say that as you well know you're you're a fallible human being which is really the best thing to be i guess the thing is so you as soon as you as soon as you show some fallibility somebody else is then ready to show theirs and you join it's, hands you join hands because everybody's going well I, i've got vulnerability too yes okay great yes. let's be vulnerable together Yes, that's exactly right. I have I found that. And also, you know, you get people who are terrified of vulnerability that just want to like destroy destroy your expression, but mm -hmm. by and large, I do think it gives people um, you know, permission. You know, I wanted to I was thinking about something I wanted to ask you because, you know, talking about fallibility and failure and stuff like that. And I know you've been asked some of these questions before, obviously, but like it's interesting to me that you had massive fame fairly quickly like i'm thinking of like you know neighbors and you know you mm -hmm. know memento and you know just a huge la confidential and i think at one point you described not these exact words but something like you felt lost you got lost 
And then eventually you had to t take a step back. And you talked about in one interview, the recognition of like, you know, what was your ego? And I thought to myself, it's, it's such a, it's such an, Im an immense self-awareness that honestly is very rare in the film industry. Well, I think it's funny because I, I, I suppose growing up with my sister and, and being acutely aware of how disadvantaged she uh, is in the world mm -hmm. and then being on Neighbours, I didn't notice it so much when I was doing theatre. I did theatre basically from, as I say, from when I was about eight to about 18 and then I got onto Neighbours when I was 18, which of course then just skyrocketed it you know it, it it became incredibly uh popular very quickly and across england etc and i just knew deep down that uh what we were doing wasn't really great work you know i knew that it and yet the attention that we got was so full on and we were being hailed as kind of something incredible. And I could, and I really realized that I think because of my upbringing with my sister, I felt that that imbalance was, was just way too, mm. was just way too much. I thought, I can't believe this. I can't believe what you're telling. I haven't done, I just landed a job on a TV show that just got really popular. So I was able to mm. sort of, make sense of it to some degree. I was only 18, 19, 20, but I, I was able to make sense of it enough where I would would sort of be stay removed from it. And, and you know, because I also felt the impulses or the or the or the the compulsion at times my ego did to 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 lap up that recognition. You know, it was mm -hmm. not when I was walking down the street and I'd be chased by a whole lot of people and you know that those were sort of scary times, I suppose. But but if we did an appearance somewhere and it was all controlled and organised, and you know, and you just go, wow, these thousands of people. We're up on five of us are up on stage, Jason and Kylie and Craig and Annie and I were up on stage doing some sort of you know appearance somewhere, mm -hmm. just going, wow, this feels incredible. <laughs> you know, but then of course going, oh my god, it also feels like a dilemma. <laughs> what's what's happening? Yeah. So, and the good thing was that those guys too were fantastic in it. And I'm close with them all still, yeah. you know, um, yeah. particularly now as we've, because we went through all that together and, and here we all are still sort of going, you know? Yeah. So it was a, it was a, it was a funny experience that, and then I suppose when I then years later got to start working in America, not that I had the same experience in America, but I kind of thought as soon as I started getting any attention in America, I was sort of ready. I was a bit more ready for it. Mm. I wasn't ready for the workload, but I was ready for the attention. I was. Re I sort of had a, a slightly healthier perspective on on fame, and you know, and I didn't really. I didn't want to do things that were just going to. My agent was trying to push me to sort of do, you know, popular superhero y type things. I was like, because and their their argument was, yeah, but if you get a lot of recognition from that, then you can choose whatever you want. And I was like, mm. no, I've done the popular thing. I'm not interested in doing it. I'm not going to do it. So I was choosing weird and wonderful, mm. interesting projects. And hence the reason, you know, a lot mm. of people have said to me, you could have had such a big career. I'm like, yeah, it's fine. My career's fine. You know? I mean, honestly, it sounds so healthy, like the way you've done it, you know? Yeah. And, but a lot of it, a lot of it, I guess, yeah, I don't know, was not fear driven, but, but there was some sort of, I had to, I, had, I really had to be in control of this kind of thing. You know, I, mm. I, I, I didn't feel very evolved as I was, as I was, you know, living out this sort of healthy career. I certainly mm -hmm. felt like I was in control of it, but 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 a bit panicked in my control of it, you know. And and mm -hmm. that that panic, I think, became exhausting. And but now, years later, I can be far more relaxed about the whole thing. So, but how did that anxiety? A shift for you? I, I ask because, you know, we, we've lived with a lot of anxiety. Like, how did that shift for you? Well, I think that year off that I took was really, it was absolutely necessary. I was going to go under. I mean, I really, as I say, I was horrible to everybody. And I remember, I remember um, I was doing a TV series in Australia in sort of uh, 93, 94, 95, 96. And it was even as early as that that I was becoming really in, in, intolerant of people, 
and I'd get to work each morning and people would say, morning, morning, how are you, morning? And, I, and I'd be like, oh, I'm fine, same as yesterday morning. You know, it, just, it was that sort of, and I was like, wow, I've really got to sort myself out here. And I was thinking back to when I'd done, a, that, that was sort of later in the thing, so like 96. And in 93, I'd done Priscilla, right, with, with mm. um, Hugo Weaving. And there's a scene in Priscilla where I tell a story to Hugo on the bus about my, you know, my uncle sexually molesting me or mm. trying to, you know, and, and, and he's in the bathtub and he wants me to get in the bathtub and I pull the plug out and his, and his, and his balls get stuck in the, you know, so I'm telling this <laughs> crazy story. And then, it, and then we see the flashback of that story and it cuts back to me and Hugo laughing, falling about laughing. And I was in a really bad mood when I started doing that scene and I just had to sort of get through it. And I remember after doing the laughing part, I was in a great mood mm. and it was a really eye-opening experience for me. So when I was, and I remember having some therapy at the time and, well, actually the, the therapy stuff came afterwards, but, but I was driving to work doing Snowy River and five minutes before I got to work each day, I would make myself laugh in the car, a fake big sort of <laughs> like a ridiculous kind of thing. And it would change my mood to the point where I could at least arrive, get out of the car. And if someone said, morning, how are you? I could go, I'm great. How are you? And then I'd get into my trailer and then I'd probably come back down to the mood again. And I'd think, well, it just gets me through the five minutes, but it's totally meaningless. It doesn't mean anything. Mm -hmm. And then I remember seeing this therapist and talking about it and he said, no, that is incredibly valuable, what, what you're doing there, because you are opening up a crack. You are, that bad mood is something that's sort of been cultivated in you over the years for whatever reasons, anxiety, etc. And I sort of, and again, getting back to how malleable we are, I then started to realise these tools that we have where we can actually sort of chemically change the mood we're in by going out for a walk, have, singing a song, making yourself laugh, doing some exercise, doing these things, mm -hmm. going, oh, wow, okay. And that was the start, I think, for me in going, I've got anxiety and I need to start working on it. And, and, and I've mm -hmm. got this great tool where as an actor, I can change my mood. Mm -hmm. I can actually be in a different mood. I, I, I know how to do that. And funnily enough, when my mother was diagnosed with Alzheimer's, and I was dealing with the Alzheimer's Australia, the organization. Mm -hmm. And she was saying, you know, we have to deal with families. Uh, we don't deal with the person who's got Alzheimer's. We have to deal with the family mm -hmm. to know how for them, for them to learn how to deal with the person who's got Alzheimer's because you're going to hear the same thing over and over again. And one of the toughest things for a person with Alzheimer's is that the family members are going, yes, mom, we know you told us that already. And then this woman from Alzheimer's Australia said, well, you're an actor, aren't you? You can be told mm -hmm. something 50 times and pretend it's the first time you've been told. <laughs> and I went, yep, yeah, okay, yep. Yeah. <laughs> so just these little things in life where I went, this skill or ability or whatever that I have, this acting ability, if I can put it to good use, I can, I can help my own insecurities, I can help my own anxiety, I can help the situation with my mum, I can maybe yeah. I can help on a on a on a bigger level, you know. But yeah. but essentially yeah. find truth for myself. And so I think that's mm. what began the sort of journey in in alleviating anxiety. I still feel the anxiety rise up, but yeah. I, I'm just better now at, you know. Yeah. And and Guy, how do you how do you stay I mean, you've been, you, you know, you, you, you've done so much work. I mean, you've been on so many sets. You've done such incredible films. How do you stay centered in the middle of what is sometimes a lot of insanity? There's, a, some, there's sometimes insanity in making films, right? So. Yeah, sometimes. I mean, most of the time, not though. Most of the time it's, you know, I mean, I guess there's some insanity because you, you're this sort of circus that's moving from place to mm -hmm. place quite quickly sometimes and the sun's going mm -hmm. down and you've got to get something done and... But I, I really love it. I stay sane because if I get to choose good jobs for myself and it's a character that I really believe in and that, you know, there's something inspiring about it, which most mm -hmm. of the time it is these days, um, that, that's just lovely and fun. And, and you know, the, the things that are hard for me, I suppose, getting back to the show you said you started watching, A Spy Among Friends, I have a lot of dialogue in that show. And learning that was hard work. Mm -hmm. um, and I, you know, again, I'm a lone wolf. I go home, you know, if I'm not watching The Vow or something like that, if I don't have <laughs> lines to learn, then I'm in my hotel room learning lines. And yeah. um, 
just you know, I have a good work ethic. Yeah, uh, I have to because I I want to feel when I'm on set, I want to feel like I know what I'm doing. If yeah. I'm, you know, if I don't, then I'm then I get a bit panicked because then guy is worrying about the lines that I don't know, and then guy's the dominant character in my head as opposed mm. to Brian the mechanic. Mm. Mm. You know? I wanted to, um, you know, I started watching The Clearing. Yeah. And because you had mentioned The Clearing and I, and I hadn't seen it. I started watching it. And honestly, even the first episode, I was so fucked up. Oh. Um, because, uh, you know, I, I'm not going to give too much away if I say this, but like the, 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 you know, the kidnapping of, the, of that little girl at the beginning and then she's thrust into this situation. And I thought to myself, oh my God, that's what boarding school felt like. You know, that's what, I had right. all these memories of boarding school. It was insane. Of, you know, because I went to boarding school, I think when I was like, six or seven and just thrust into a situation where nobody's giving you any help or any comfort or any anything you just got to figure your shit out you know that's just but so insane isn't it I it's mean insane it's just not healthy um and and weirdly enough in the midst of so many people i became a lone wolf you know like you right. and that's what's so interesting about you talking about the lone wolf thing because i am a lone wolf for me to actually join an organization and to open up takes so much and just to go back to the beginning, I think that's why it hurt so much because yeah. I was like, I'm a loner, I'm a loner, I'm a loner. Film sets are different, you know, because I can be a loner and I can interact in a film set very well yeah. because like I can go back to the cave afterwards. Well, and you know, it's only temporary as well. It's just temporary. Yeah, it's, it's, it's the circus. But there's something about when you're a lone wolf and you open yourself up, finally you say, finally, I feel safe enough to open up to these people or finally I found my people or finally I found people that, that think like me or finally I found a male friendship that I can trust. Yeah. And that, that terrible, terrible vulnerability. And then when that gets hurt, you know, that's what, that's what kind of fucks you up, you know? I'm sure that must, be, I mean, again, you know, your, your analysis of all of this must be really helpful for you. And I'm, I'm curious how, how, how much of this on a sort of daily level is, is, is hovering with you or how much you actively try, you know, to sort of keep, keep it at bay or not at bay, but mm -hmm. yeah, I, I, I mean, it's, it's, it's hard for me to mm -hmm. really understand obviously, cause I didn't go through it and sort of, I talk to you and all I am aware of is the, is the experience that you had, which mm -hmm. for you now is, you know, I guess a couple of years ago mm -hmm. and, and you're trying to get on with your life, right? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I, I suppose actually one question I wanted to ask you to add to mm -hmm. that is, mm -hmm. are you friends with, have you stayed in contact and are you friends with people that went through that experience? And if so, do you, uh, are you able to talk about other things in life or do you need each other to, to kind of be able to still dissect and, and go back through what happened? I that think we did need each other for that for a long time. Um, I stay marginally in touch, marginally in touch with, with, with people. I think one of the things that's happened with everybody is like, we also want to get on with our life and we don't want to keep on having those conversations. Yeah. Right. But I do have some very beautiful friendships that, that I've developed. And so those people, it's like going through something intense, going through a war, going through whatever. You're, you're very, very close but we don't we don't talk a lot necessarily, you know. And with ongoing legal type things, you know, we, we still have to talk about some of those things. But there was a time when we had to defrag our our hard drives together, and the only way you could successfully do that is by sharing information, and then hearing somebody else say, they go, "Oh my God, that's how I felt. That's how I felt. That's that happened to me. That happened to me." Right. Because that's what helps you make sense. You have to do it. In relationship, like like having a therapist is is a relational ex experience. You have to do it in relation to another human being, so it's really essential. But I think for some people, they they don't want to talk about these things anymore, and you know I, you don't want to talk to them be, because it brings everything up. So I just I tend to stay away. And also the the issue, Sarah and I were having a conversation about this. You know, because we were in a certain certain leadership role, I've I've made it. Uh, um, it's been a really important thing for me to to disabuse anybody of the notion that I'm a leader in any way. Right. So, like, I don't want to be that 
figurehead. Yeah. You know? So like yes, I'm just that's right because you were you I'm were just in, me. You know? Yeah, yeah, yeah. You were in quite a position of, you know, responsibility, I guess. Yeah. Well, a lot of people, a lot of people, you know, looked up to me, and it was weird because when I when I went rogue, so to speak, um, it was very confusing for people because they're like, "Wait, you thought this was good?" I go, "Yeah, I know, I was wrong." And they were like, what? They just, wow. they couldn't wrap their head around that. Well, I was going to say, I'm sure you just felt, as, as you say, that you, you just had no choice. You just had to get this out. So that's all there was to it. No choice. You know, I, I was not holding anything back. But the thing is, I look back at it now. I'm really, really happy with my choices. You yeah. know, like, okay, I screwed up. I messed up. I didn't, I didn't understand what a psychopath really was. You know, I didn't understand that somebody could lie the way, you know, I was lied to. But then once I did realize, like, I feel really good about my choices. Yeah, you know? right. Yeah. Really good. Like, I feel really proud of myself that I can say, if I die tomorrow, I know that I did this thing that was really good, is that when I found out that this thing was immoral and was evil, I did every single thing I could, I could to stop it. I feel really good about that. And that's, that's a really, that's an amazing strength, isn't it? Because I think so often in life we see things that aren't, uh, going as they should and we we tend to go I'll just uh, I'll let someone else deal with that yeah yeah I just I think it was growing up in South Africa as well you know just seeing seeing injustice yeah you know and I thought I was part of something really good you know and it's funny just I want to go back to clearing for a second because you know I was thinking to myself as I was watching the clearing um I don't know, do you want to talk about the clearing at all just yeah. sort of set yeah, yeah. set that up a bit I'd love you to set that up well, it's um, this is a show that we made in Australia. Um, coincidentally, it just made it about six months before I saw your show, The Vow. Uh, and it, all, all the names have been changed for legal reasons. It can't claim to be um, uh, the family, which was a which was a cult that occurred in Melbourne, uh, in Australia, uh, sort of. I think even as early as the early 70s, um, mm. but really uh, and probably some of those people gathered together in the late 60s. I can't remember the actual dates, but through the 70s and 80s where uh, Anne Hamilton Byrne, a very charismatic woman, and this is obviously what's unusual about this story as well, is that, is that, a, that there was a female leader, which mm. is, I guess you would attest to that, is that that's unusual. Yeah. Um, uh, and together with a group of people uh, began what they saw as, uh, you know, the opportunity to create a better life and a, a better world. And they, they were able to and they had access to adopt or obtain children from hospitals and through doctors, etc. Mm. They ended up sort of creating this little, little family uh, that started to grow and they were in a fairly remote part of uh, the outskirts of Melbourne. And of course, you know, there was abuse and things came crashing down. And it's a pretty horrific, uh, it's a pretty horrific story. And obviously also what's horrific about it is that those kids are still alive today mm. and have been highly traumatized. And I play a character in the show who is a real character in the, in the real life experience, but the name is again changed, who was a professor, an English professor who sort of had rather obscure ways of looking at the world um, uh, and was a lecturer at university and was often sort of um, told off by the heads at the, at the deans at the university saying, you know, what you're teaching is this is not part of the curriculum. And, mm. and he was quite scientific and really believed that, you know, communities should be able to, to function the way they wanted to function and, and not have to conform to society's norms that were limiting, et cetera, et cetera. Mm -hmm. He was a character, the guy that I played was a character who was, who had really no charisma, but was, was, was super intelligent. As you point out, it, it kind of begins with, with the kidnapping of a child. Yeah. And which just in itself is, is beyond, you know, <laughs> it's, it's unbelievable. You know, also, I, I will say just in terms of craft, what I've seen thus far of episode one, it's very well made. And, and the performances are incredible. Yeah, it's really well made. And, and Miranda stuff. Otto, who plays the, 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 the female lead, is, is fantastic. And, and um, 
the the story jumps back and forth between the present mm-hmm. day and the past. So we see some right. of these children, you know, grown up. Yeah. And 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 the other thing I was thinking, guys, as watching it, it, is again like every one of the characters, you know, who make up this cult, you know, except for maybe one, seem they have so much conviction about wh- what they're doing that it's the right thing to do. Mm-hmm. And it just it's yeah. so scary to watch that. And when I saw your character, I was like, oh no. <laughs> he's really has a lot of conviction really shit committed. yeah 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 it was a really interesting thing to do and i you know the writer i know and the director i know so we'd worked together before and um it was very weird on set because we had these kids and of course one of the things that the leader did was make all the kids bleach their hair blonde yeah so there's a sort of a you know i mean it's like the branding to, to a degree isn't it um yeah, yeah. and so there we were on set with all these kids in the same blue skivvies and the sort of blonde wigs and just going, oh, wow, this is so... Yeah. Trying to sort of make light of it and have fun and, you know, try, yeah. try to sort of create an enjoyable set, which you want to do when you've got kids on set anyway. Yeah, of course. You know. Of course. Um, of course. I mean, look, it's, 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 it's super creepy. Yeah, it's very it's, creepy. I agree. It's very creepy. The thing about your... I mean, the thing about your experience and your show, the creepiness... It, 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 certainly in the way the show was presented and and I'm and I don't know if this happened in real life but it seemed the creepiness didn't really appear and it really crept in later i mean that that everything seemed sort of super normal and corporate and kind of yeah you know. so one of the things that happened you know in season 1 is that shortly before you know shortly before the 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 cut was locked you know it it be, it began in, in episode one, you kind of see the creepiness. And sure. we had extensive discussions and we said, look, this is not going to work. This is, you have to seduce the audience into the dream first. You cannot just show the creepiness because part of what happens with people that go through these things is they get uh, told things like, why couldn't you see it? It's so obvious. So we thought, okay, let's, let's, so that there was this I'll new episode. So yeah. This new episode one that came in, which was basically the dream. To, to basically get the audience to feel the dream because that's what we were sold on and that's what we thought we were experiencing for a long time. Yeah. It was only towards the very end that we started being like, wait, we knew things were messed up and people were not very good at their jobs and this, that, and the other, and there's some odd things going on. But we n- it never occurred to me that it was the leader. Like I was talking to Ranieri about other people that I thought could potentially be psychopaths and he was engaging me in those discussions. And then wow. the trick, of course, is... He's the psychopath, you know, yeah. I, and, yeah. and I didn't know that. But we had to get the audience to, to feel that. And I think that was very successful. So by the time you get into episode two is that's when you start to be like, wait, things are not quite. So it's a very abbreviated version sure. In, sure. in many ways. But I think you have to get people to experience the sort of the love bombing phase of that, of that you know, narcissistically abusive relationship, which is you're presented with the best of everything. And you're, you're loved and you're, you know, raised onto pedestals and, you know, your ego gets involved because you're told you're incredible and you're wonderful. And we've been looking for someone like you and, you know, that, that works, that shit yeah. works until well, you've I, overcome I you've, that. I know you've said before that they did homework on you beforehand. So they, they then come prepared as far as, yeah. as far as what yeah. to talk to you about and how to talk to you, etc. Yeah. Yeah. Well, the one one incredible thing about your show too is that is that there is so much footage and so much audio recording. Yeah. Which yeah. you know one of the things I can't stand usually when I watch a, any kind of documentary is reenactment. Yeah. And I get that reenactment has to happen, but sure. you know of, often it's a it's a it just takes me out of it. Um, whereas yeah. with yours, and 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 I suppose my understanding is that that because of Keith's ego, he wanted things to be filmed, right? Yeah. Is that, is that, yeah. So yeah. But that in the end turned against him. I right? think, I think that he imagined that this would be this great library of knowledge that future generations, you know, would use and sort of think about him. Understand he actually read the foundation, the, the, the foundation series books when he was right. very young and became very entranced by that whole thing. Okay. You know, so that was very, very interesting. But yeah, the, the vow is interesting. Yes, there's a lot of archival, there's sort of retrospective talking about the things that happened. But what's amazing about it is a lot of it's happening in real time. So basically, for almost three years, we were just 
cameras were going all the time. I mean, there's so much footage that never ended up in the vow. Right. Because you never knew what was going on. And when the project started, we didn't know if, if, if the, he was going to get arrested. We thought, and the reason that I was recording so obsessively is because their playbook was to get the whistleblowers prosecuted and put in prison. So my assumption was that was going to happen to us. And so for that reason, I wanted to document everything as we were waking up because at least I could say, this is what actually happened. Here are the time codes. Here are the timestamps. And did it, did it seem at all, were there times when you were filming and he would say, why are you filming this? Or was there just ne no, never even a question because he just loved it anyway? Because, I mean, I guess because of, you know, because I was a cinematographer for a long time. So, like, yeah. you know, when I showed up, they were like, oh, this guy knows, knows how to use cameras. So I, I just sh shot things and I got a lot of access, except there were certain times I, I couldn't shoot. Sure. Which I wasn't sure why. Later, I realized why, because he's, you know, probably diddling somebody. You know, I didn't understand what was really going on necessarily. Right. right. Um, but yeah, th there was a, there was a lot of access, and I think it speaks to like his mindset of like he wants all these things recorded because he felt like he wanted to present himself as somebody that was the pinnacle of character, standing up against adversity. Yeah. And for for the world to understand how to do that, they have to see somebody who's doing it. That was his sort of delusional belief. Yeah. yeah, which is funny because then when you see how he actually behaved when the when the Mexican police come and get him, that's the real him. Yeah, yeah, sure, that's right. You know? it's so interesting, isn't it? Because there there must be so many people in the world, a lot of us who have insecurities, feel like we're we're not as we're not we're just not valid. We're not we don't have a good identity. We don't we don't feel like we have a place in the world, and we try stuff on. And, you know, we're getting rejected constantly, even in the shop, if we're trying to be charismatic to somebody, you know, and just things aren't working. And then every now and then someone comes along who has charisma, yeah, who has the gift of the gab, who has yeah. some ability. I mean, even when pe I did a film about Andy Warhol and people often, mm. Liza Minnelli, various people talk about Andy Warhol and say mm. what you guys said about Keith, which was, he had an incredible ability to make you feel like you were the only person in the room, that, yes. that he was listening to you and focusing on you that just made you go, oh, wow, that is intoxicating. Yes. And that's what a, tool, what a tool, you know. And also that some of these people, they seem so confident. They have this unshakable confidence. And there's a part of us, I think, that yearns for that. Like, I want to know what that feels like. Yes. Now, it doesn't occur to us that a psychopath can have unshakable confidence like that. Nobody taught us that. Yeah. Yeah. So there are people walking around in the world that have unshakable confidence because they have no anxiety. Like a true psychopath has no anxiety. Well, that's the interesting thing, isn't it? So there's a sort of an audacity. There's a, an audacious ability just to go, no, this, no, that. Yeah. And you just go, yeah. oh, okay. it seems convincing. Yeah. I mean, funnily enough, I have to be like that with my child. You know, I can't, uh, I can't say to him, you know, you can't sort of say, you can't pose things as a question or you can't, you just have to be really definite. Yeah. I'm sure all parents will say the same thing. Yeah. As soon as they see that there's a crack, they go, oh, hang on a second. Exactly. <laughs> I can bring exactly. you down. Exactly. But, you know, I do think in, in the end, I think that people are very, very vulnerable. And I think there's these things we yearn for. And I feel like now, many years later, I no longer feel ashamed for the things I yearned for. Like I'd perfectly right. natural that I wanted to be a better version of myself. It's perfectly natural that I wanted to make the world better. It's perfectly natural that I've been involved in a lot of self-help stuff because that's my, that's my drive. You know, I was so ashamed of it, but like, that's a lot of people have that. Do you, is it, has it gone as far as being able to say, this is actually the best thing that's ever happened to me? Or is yeah, that it has actually, it has, it has because like I, like I, I now know myself better than I ever have before in my life. Cause honestly, I just, I looked outside for, for, I looked for, for some kind of validation outside of, of what I felt I didn't have. Mm -hmm. And the thing in the end, the recognition that I was projecting onto a bunch of different leaders attributes that I already loved and probably already possessed. That's why I could recognize them in a projective manner the recognition that that was actually mine was staggering to me. Right. It was like coming home. 
you know, like I, I came home because I realized, you know, like in the, in the, um, do you remember the book, The Alchemist by pa Paulo Coelho? Yeah. Like the treasure he was looking for, he was sleeping on top of it. Yes. Yes. And he right. went to the pyramids to get it and it wasn't there. And he went through all these terrible things, got beaten up and blah, blah, blah. And I love that story because that's kind of what it felt like to me is like, I already had the treasure that I thought other people had, you yeah. know? Yeah. It's an amazing, it is an amazing test for all of us in life, isn't it? That mm -hmm. really, you know, they talk about, I'm sure Jesus even said it as well, that, that God is within you. You mm -hmm. know, it's, it's, it's mm -hmm. there already. Look yes. for it here. Don't sort of, you know. Yes. But, you know, hearing it is, it's different hearing it than truly grokking it. Mm -hmm. You know, like, and for me, the reason it's the best thing that ever happened is because I, I said this to somebody recently. If I, if I was outside of myself and I looked at Mark and I looked at what Mark was doing, which is this obsessive need to, to look at other people for the answer, how, what do we do with this guy? And what we do with this guy is let's get him betrayed so badly that it breaks <laughs> everything. <wake> up. <laughs> yeah. So that's what happened. I got betrayed so badly and, I, and then I threw everything out. Yeah. And then I, as I, when I threw everything out, I was like, oh, there is actually a, something in the middle here that I think is me, the real me. And now I yeah. can go now from this place, I can go and investigate the world again. And it's not, you know, I, it's like the power of now, isn't it? It's like a, yeah. a role sort of yeah. feels like that where you just kind of go, oh, hang on. I, I had to be snapped in half in order to sort I of. I had to be. I had to be. And also, like I felt when I left, I, oh, I just wasted 12 years of my life. And now I'm like, no, I didn't. Right. I didn't waste the time. How, like, old I you have... you, how old were you when that 12 years started? So th I would have been 39, I guess. Right. 39. Because like I, I have a certain perspective now. I'm not saying it's a great perspective. I'm not saying I'm a smart per I'm not saying any of that stuff. I just have a perspective now that I love. Yeah, right. Which is now, like I'm acutely aware of what I call evil, but at the same time, I'm also acutely aware of what I think goodness is, and I find it beautiful. Yeah, yeah. You know, you're an yeah. amazing man. I have to say. You've oh, likewise, mate. You, likewise, you, you have such likewise. beautiful energy, and I, I, I really hope we can work together one day. I'd love to. Be we're gonna, to we're gonna do it. We are gonna do it. <laughs> I, I do have one final question for you, and then we'll wrap it up because yes. I have an audience that that you know is curious about things. Um. What advice do you have for other artists and actors? And I don't mean in terms of being successful. I mean in terms of being good at their craft, authentic. Like what advice would you have? It's funny. It's an interesting question that because I've, I've been asked this before and I find I, I never really know if I can answer that on a general level. I've been asked by young actors before, uh, about advice and then I will get into a conversation with them about what feels difficult, what feels challenging, what feels easy, et cetera, et cetera. And, and from that, I feel like I'm able to offer some sort of advice if, I, if in fact I am. Um, you know, I think one of the things that, and I don't know if this is about advice, but one of the things that as a young actor, you, you, you're so desperate to sort of find work and to be recognized and to, you know, and that, so that, that desperation, that drive you have, I'm always wanting, you know, of course I want young actors to, to, to still have a drive, but not to be sort of panicked by that, not to be, um, yeah, not, not, to, not to then get out of control because of that. But at the same time, I'm also aware that people have to go through the journey they have to go through. Yeah. I mean, the, I, I jokingly say, but I really, really mean it as well. That if, if I was to offer general advice to actors, it is learn your lines. <laughs> learn your lines, learn your lines. Not so you're not wasting everyone's time, but having done a lot of theatre, I find when I know the character as well as I do, when I know the character really deeply, when I know the lines so back to front that I'm not actually sort of flying by the seat of my pants, it becomes something else. It's like chewing on a dry cracker for, for five minutes as opposed to then 20 minutes. After about 20 minutes, it starts to taste like something else. So if you can deeply understand why you're doing what you're doing, why you want to do it, and I think that's one of the other things. A lot of young actors want to be famous. A lot of young singers just want to be famous. I'm like, well, you know, let's look at what it is you want to express. Why, what is it that you want to express? I would say if I was to have advice, it would be 
try and understand why you're wanting to do what it is you're wanting to do. You know, is it just about recognition or is it actually because you've got some story to tell or you've got some internal, you know, is this about your your own identity? So to try and yeah. understand that to some degree. Yeah. Guy, so good to talk to you. Mark, thank you very much. An absolute pleasure. I hope we can do it again.